a noisy demonstration makes its way through the streets of Belfast. This is part of the image of Ulster, which millions of people throughout the world saw in 1969. The press, television and film cameras covered each riot and showed the devastation. And yet, how accurate a picture of events in Ulster was projected? Just a few hundred yards from these scenes of devastation, in the grounds of the City Hall on a summer afternoon, people are reading about the events of the previous night. For the strange thing is that 95% of the population of Ulster have never seen a petrol bomb or a stone thrown in anger. They too, like you, have only watched it on television. Before 1969, for many people, this was the image of Ulster. These cottages, in fact, are on the grounds of the Ulster Folk Museum. So could it be that the new image of Ulster is no more accurate than the old? Join me then for an inside look at this country, beginning with its parliament at Stormont. The founder figure of Northern Ireland was Sir Edward Carson, a Dublin lawyer who 50 years ago demonstrated his loyalty to the Crown by raising an army to fight against the British army for the right to remain joined to Britain. Such then are the complexities of politics which face any Ulster Prime Minister and in that position at the beginning of 1969 was Captain Terence O'Neill. I asked him how did he feel our image had been affected by the events of the past year. Scenes on the streets, wherever they may take place in any part of the world, are good television and good news, and therefore people who have never heard of Northern Ireland before in their lives first of all, hear of it in this way, and that, I think, obviously, is a bad thing and can't do Northern Ireland any good. And the only sad thing is that what started in the streets on October last year has tended, perhaps, to make people think that relations between the two sections of the community in Northern Ireland are not as good as, in fact, they really are. But in the end, it was not the actions of the civil rights movement which made his lonely position in the cabinet room impossible, but rather those of the right wing of his own unionist party, who refused to accept the need of any reform. The strength of this Protestant backlash was demonstrated in the February elections, and soon afterwards, Captain O'Neill resigned. To understand the fears of this extreme Protestant group, you have to go back into history even further than the event which this crowd is celebrating here at Larne. They are here to welcome the Clyde Valley, a rather battered old tramp steamer which 50 years ago, at the time of the First World War, smuggled guns from Germany in a last attempt to fight against Britain and stave off the home rule which the majority of the people of Ireland wanted. For over 300 years since the time of the plantation, when Irish Roman Catholics were driven out of this corner of Ireland and replaced by Protestant settlers, the power and the privilege has been in the hands of a Protestant ascendancy. Up to now, the minority have only made up a third of the population of Northern Ireland, but at the moment, more than half the children in schools are Roman Catholics. For these Protestants, perhaps there is a fear that now their time is coming. We have had enough of this blatant injustice. We have had enough of persecution. I want to say to the Northern Ireland government, we have desisted from taking our people on to the streets. But if that's what they want, if they want to see the Protestants on the streets, then we'll go on the streets. The civil rights movement began as a non-sectarian organization protesting against discrimination and the wrongs of local government. Here, too, the image that went abroad was a violent demonstration when, in fact, most meetings were like this, with students exchanging jokes with the police and talking to passers-by. 
The photographers here today will not be handing in pictures because nothing violent enough happened to be newsworthy. Such disturbances usually occurred when there were counter demonstrations, but on this Saturday morning, the shoppers are only amused that those who claim greatest loyalty to the British throne seem to show least respect to the British flag, which has become little more than a provocative symbol. I'm so sorry that all these street scenes have taken place. I think the civil rights themselves were perfectly sincere. And even pleasant scenes like these children at an Irish dancing class underline the division inside the community. For just as many Protestants regard themselves as being British and look towards England, so too many of the Catholic minority keep up the old Irish tradition and take very little part in the community. The division too has been artificially fostered in the field of education because at the age of five, Roman Catholic and Protestant children are segregated and go to separate schools. Although recent surveys have shown that the vast majority of teachers and Roman Catholic parents would like to see their children educated with Protestants, the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church insists that they should be educated separately. It is fortunate that this division ends at university level and perhaps significant that among teachers, lawyers, doctors and other professional people, religious intolerance and prejudice is virtually non-existent. But divisions do exist inside the Unionist Party. Talking to these six formers on a visit to Stormont is William Craig. Representing traditional unionism, he has been called a rebel because his views are now in opposition to those of the leaders of his party. Well, I think it's quite inaccurate to call me a rebel. I'm a member of the Unionist Party and exercise my right to help to formulate the policy decisions of the Unionist Party. Another influence in Ulster politics has been that of the Orange Order, to which most Unionist politicians belong. Political meetings are held in Orange Halls, and the Order is represented on the executive of the party. Although 100% Protestant, the order claims to stand for civil and religious liberty. William of Orange has become something of a Protestant folk hero, although he came to the Battle of the Boyne as an ally of the Pope, who celebrated his victory with a special mass in St. Peter's. The Orange Order was not founded until long after William's death and indeed Catholics and Protestants fought side by side in the 98th Rebellion. In the 19th century, the order had fallen into disrepute, and it was only opposition to the Home Rule movement which brought it back into prominence. Today, out of a population of one and a half million, there are 100,000 Orangemen who celebrate on the 12th of July. This, together with an almost identical ceremony of bands, banners and marching by the ancient order of Hibernians, represents Ulster's only real piece of pageantry. The tragedy is that it cannot be celebrated by the whole community, but remains one piece of history to be used to remind the other side of a victory and a defeat. But it would be wrong to give the impression of Ulster as a country living entirely in the past, as some of the news media have done. There is another side to be seen in the offices of local authorities where plans are being laid for more modern motorways and buildings. How much do people outside Northern Ireland really know about this side of things, I asked Captain O'Neill. They do not realise for instance, that we had a motorway here before they had a motorway in Scotland. They do not realize the tremendous developments that are going on in our shipyard here. They do not realize the very high level uh, of our hospital services in Northern Ireland. They concentrate on the uh, exciting, sensational, 
street scenes to the exclusion of all the progress. And of course this can all be summed up really in the old, old statement that good news is not news. Although there is still a housing shortage, thousands of new homes have been built in the cities and housing estates have grown up around their edges. Three quarters of our children are being educated in schools built since the war. And some television viewers must have been surprised by the fact that petrol bomb throwers were not operating from small tumble-down hovels, but from the tops of blocks of modern flats. What we have done here in the way of building a modern infrastructure is indeed an example to many developing regions throughout the world. And I can well remember when I was Minister of Development receiving almost weekly visits from foreign journalists from every part of the world to study Ulster's new development plan. The record of local councils and housing was one of the main areas of contention. But the setting up of the housing executive ensured a fair system of allocation. And the executive have built thousands of new homes and is tackling the problem of the inner city. Although journalists sometimes mistook slum clearance for bomb damage. But let's look now at another field in which Ulster has led the world. Some years ago, the container revolution began right here in Larne. This modern method of carrying goods from manufacturer to distributor unopened was ideal for many of the small precision items made in Ulster. And not only goods have been carried across the Irish Sea and North Channel, increasing numbers of holidaymakers are finding their way here and discovering the beauty of Ireland's countryside. I think that the best way of improving our image abroad is by encouraging visits to Northern Ireland and encouraging Northern Ireland people to travel abroad. For far too long, I think we've been a little bit insular in our outlook and we're largely to blame ourselves for this. These were the scenes which visitors to Ulster saw in the summer of 1969 peaceful fields and quiet open roads. Many expressed surprise about how different this was from the image that the media was projecting. But then in the summer of 1969, no one had yet been killed on the streets of Ulster. Troops would not arrive until August. Internment was two years away. The farms and industries were prosperous in these years before the oil crisis began. In the shipyard there is the largest dry dock in Europe and one of the largest cranes in the world. It was here during the summer that thousands of workers, Catholic and Protestant, got together to resolve that there should be no trouble. Although less than 2% of industry was affected, there is still the tragedy of individuals driven from their homes by religious and political prejudice. In the second half of the 20th century, there are still Ulstermen who can hate each other in the name of Christ. This barricade mentality exists in the identical tight little streets of the Falls and Shankill. The irony is that in England they would probably both vote socialist, but because of Ulster's peculiar position, they must take up sides on either side of a political barrier which was drawn over 300 years ago between orange Tories and green Tories. There is still a very substantial minority, approximately one third of the population, who do not accept the Constitution. And all the blame cannot be placed on the minority. Some blame must attach to the majority for failing to make a conversion to the value of our present Constitution. But one of the big steps towards better relations which have taken place has been the inauguration of community weeks. Here the governor of Northern Ireland takes part in one in Ballinahinch where it all started. Well, I think our civic weeks have been a very great success. And the proof of that is that uh, both extremes of the political spectrum in Northern Ireland dislike them intensely. The first civic week we held in Ballinahinch the, the uh, Paisley bully boys tried to bust it up and uh, the first civil rights march which took place last autumn had on one of its banners to hell with O'Neill's civic weeks. 
This increasing willingness to get on together is reflected in the choice of theme for this year's Lord Mayor's Show in Belfast. This shows the modern, more progressive face of Ulster in its most colourful form. Huge international firms like ICI, DuPont and Michelin, together with British Anklon and Grundig and many other firms, have put their trust in Ulster's future. Amongst informed people, there is a very good picture of Northern Ireland as a developing progressive community. Indeed, when one considers the amount of international investment that has taken place in Northern Ireland, you realize then that there is a very good side to the Northern Ireland story. There's something like over 30 North American firms have invested in Northern Ireland. It from Western Europe have invested. This is the sort of picture that I would like to see shouted even louder throughout the four corners of the world. What we have done here in the way of building a modern infrastructure is indeed an example to many developing regions throughout the world. And I can well remember when I was Minister of Development receiving almost weekly visits from foreign journalists from every part of the world to study Ulster's new development plans. And I would hope that the priorities of politics will soon get us back to talking about these things once again. The Lord Mayor launched the show and the 70s in a spirit of optimism unaware of the tragedy that the next 10 years would bring to his city and to the province. In 10 years, 2,000 people died, 355 of them soldiers, and 17,000 were injured. But in the end, the Ulster image must not reflect just the activities of the terrorists who wish to live in the past, but rather those of the ordinary decent Ulster people who have lived through these years and to whom the future belongs.